Hey guys, and welcome to another online lesson. Okay, so today we're going to look at instruments specifically, how to practice, and everything that's in the process involving of practicing your instrument and getting ready for a Sunday performance. All right, so let's say you just receive an email or a text message from your church worship, worship leader and you've been booked for the gig. Good job. Okay, now what is going to happen next? So there's a couple of things, uh, talking points I'll have today just to discuss these things a little bit in depth. And these are just my personal opinions. It's not set in stone. Um, it's just things I've noticed over the years um, that works well and some things that don't work so well. And uh, just typically my own personal point of view, um, it's not set in stone. So uh, it's just some observations I've made. And um, hopefully soon we can have like a Q&A session. So if you've got any uh, you know, questions and, and something you want to ask or you don't understand, um, I'll gladly help you out and answer them as truthfully as I possibly can. Right, so um, I'm just going to la label a couple of steps here of what we're going to do. Um, and it's not going to be a really a play lesson so much today, but just to give you an idea of um, things in the industry and a better way of probably doing it. Okay, so step number one, communication. So that is very, very important in the whole process of you starting to prepare the song to the point where you play the song on Sunday. Now, communication, that is when you start, when you receive your email or your text message from your worship leader or music director of the band. And ideally, what you would want to receive in this message is the following information. Time and date, when you're going to perform, is there going to be a rehearsal? Um, then you want a reference track, maybe a recording a YouTube link uh, or a streaming service such as Apple Music or Spotify, these are any of those. You can reference the track and then some sort of chart uh, just to give you an idea of what chords is being played and just have some general structure. Okay, with the links, um, just uh, interesting things like YouTube uh, when it comes to royalties are not the greatest paying service for this. So if you have a streaming service, uh, which most people do have, music streaming service, rather send people direct links to Apple Music or Spotify and those because they pay the artist better money than YouTube does. So yeah, just support your fellow musicians, uh, whether it's local artists, international artists, they just get a little bit more money from streaming sites than actually getting a, a link from YouTube. So. Just to be in mind, although there's nothing wrong with the YouTube link, if you're comfortable using YouTube, um, no problem at all. It's just something to consider in terms of if you want to support your fellow artists. All right, so now you've received um, these things, you, you, it's very important to look at the chart that's given to you, and like I said, communication is very important. Um, you need to know exactly before you even start listening to the song, preparing the song, um, whether you're going to play the song exactly as a replica uh, recover replica of the, the recording you received, or was that just a reference for you to like, okay, that's kind of what the melody does, but you might do it in another key. And um, these things are very important because I've been to band rehearsals where stuff has been sent to me, and then you have to rock up in the rehearsals. I oh, know the singer didn't want to sing this song anymore, we change it all the time to a song, and the rehearsal process just turns out chaotically. Okay, and what we want to try and avoid is. We don't want a, a chaos uh, situation running through the rehearsal. We want the rehearsal to go as smooth as possible. All the groundwork should start at home in your practice session. Okay, so communication, um, very important between your music director or worship leader and you and your uh, your band, everybody to it. So whether it's WhatsApp group, whatever, but um, communication is very important here. So everyone needs to know before they start prepping the song what key it is in. What style is it going to be? Is it going to be very similar to the original recording you received? Um, and there's a couple of factors also involved there because if you think of, let's say, Hill songs or a Bethel song, then it gets a bit difficult because there's there's budget in those recordings. I mean, if you listen to, if you go to those churches, there is um, an eight or a ten piece band sometimes playing, and they're playing with tracks as professionally produced in studio. 
So it's a different situation. Maybe you in a small congregation and you probably have, let's say, maybe three or four musicians on stage and you have to simulate kind of what's happening there. It's not going to be the easiest task to, um, to perform. So you must also work with your band leader or worship leader and see what is going to be fit for purpose for your specific needs in your church. So um, charts, very important to have. It's a good reference to start practicing on. And I'll put some examples. I think we'll look at the song. Let me quickly have a look here. Lion and the Lamb. And there's two charts here that we can look at. And I, I'm going to talk about the most common one we get, and that's a typical lyric sheet. Okay, so the lyric sheet is just the lyrics written down on a piece of paper, and above certain lyrics, they'll put a chord symbol. And um, most of you are familiar with this uh, format of charts. Um, I'm personally not a big fan of them, but it's got its place in music as well. So I think once you have played the song before, or you listen to the song, you kind of know the song, then this format um, can work successfully. But if it's a situation where you if we rocked up for the for the gig and you have no idea what the sound the song sounds like and you just have to play and read, it could be a bit problematic. And uh, the problem here is when you have the lyrics in front of you, you've got the chord changes uh, above certain lyrics, but it doesn't give you as much information as you really need. And that could be like a lyric. Um, you're not sure if the chord could start at the beginning of the lyric, or the middle of the lyric. You don't know how long um, a specific lyric, the duration of a certain word is in a lyric. So those things can be complicated if you're not too familiar with the song. But I mean, they got their place. Um, they're great for vocalists because, I mean, at the end of the day, they're just going to worry about the lyrics. Um, they're going to memorize the melody. So it's not a train smash for those guys. Um, the chart I prefer to receive for, for one of these um, worship gigs is your typical chord chart. And I'll also see if I can put an example in there for you. Now, the chord chart um, is written on the stave, like, like proper music notation, but it's very condensed in the sense that it doesn't give you as much information um, or like too much information. It will just give you like a general idea what the rhythm section of the band, in other words, the drums, the bass, the keyboard, the guitars, those kind of guys that kind of put the, you know, produce the song as such, um, what information they need in a condensed form. Now, if we look at, um, let's find my example here of Lion and Lamb, um, there's another chart here where they give me a lot of information. So if I just look um, at the chart, I've got the title on top, then it gives me a little quarter note equals to 90. Tells me immediately okay, this is the tempo of the song. Okay, that I wouldn't have found maybe on the lyric chart. Then it's got section breakdowns. It tells me, okay, there's treble clef, so which is common clef we're gonna use. Got five sharps, so immediately I know the key of B major, timings four, four. Okay, there I've learned a ton of information just looking at the very first line of the song. And then I see there's some notes written out. This it says drum pickup there, and I can see. Okay, there's a couple of notes here. So that's probably like an intro riff that the guitarist is going to play, for instance. So there I've got a cue. So even if I'm not playing that particular section in the song, it tells me where I am in the song. And repeat signs, a little brackets around it. It tells me, okay, that first four bars, then they play twice. Then I've got an indication saying verse. And then I've got a couple of bars there with chord symbols above and just some slashes. Okay, so that's very limited information. But that's all I need there because I can see there's chord change, there's a B chord change on, on beat one of bar six, and then it goes to C sharp minus seven uh, in bar seven. But this is where it gets quite uh, important. But now I can see the C sharp is changing halfway through the second bar there. On the lyric sheet, I wouldn't have known that. If I didn't know the song well, if I didn't know the lyrics, I wouldn't have known where to put that C sharp minor chord. Now I can see exactly where I need to change that chord. And then I can see on the third bar it goes to E, uh, and then on bar 10 goes to G sharp minor, and so on. And then I can see that the sections are labeled verse, chorus, and then uh, DC al fine, which means going back to the top and play to the end. 
So I've got all this information condensed on one or two pieces of paper. And if there's anything specific that I need to play, it will be written out for me. So these kind of um, core charts, way to go. It gives you a lot more information, especially if you're not 100% sure of the song. So also my favorite type of chart, um, nothing wrong with the lyric chart. The lyric chart is also, it's a valid way of working with music. Um, it gives you information. It's just a little bit too limited in my sense. If you don't know the song, you're not familiar with the song. So um, if you're not 100% sure how chord charts work, I uh, suggest we can do a tutorial on that or um, check out some, you know, ask somebody who knows a little bit more about how they work. Um, it's a very easy way of reading, a very basic sight reading method. So not everything is written out for you, but it gives you a little bit more information in the lyric sheet. And um, once you get used to reading a chord chart, it makes life just a lot easier. Okay, so these are the things you are looking for once you get booked. So you can get an email or a WhatsApp message, whatever, uh, provided they send you know, the chord chart. And this has to be in the same key as what you're going to play them on the day. So just make sure those things are communicated clearly beforehand. Um, you don't want to rock up to a Sunday service and you prepare everything perfectly and only to find out within the first bar you know, a different key than the rest of the band and it wasn't communicated and it will just sound like utter chaos. You don't want that. So these things um, need to be communicated very, very clearly. All right, then how to approach the song. Okay, so the first thing I would do is when I receive the email or the booking, uh, whether it's a text message or whatever uh, format of communication that you guys prefer, and start to listen to the song. You put the song on, on your Apple Music, your Spotify, or whatever, listen to it in the car. When you're commuting, um, even when you're not actively sitting in front of your keyboard and practicing, just get a, a, an idea of what the sound, the song sounds like, um, get familiar with the melody, aspects like that. Um, do that a couple of times, and then once you get into your practice session, that's when uh, you should start looking at specific things, a little bit more in depth of what's happening, when the chords are changing. And specific riffs. So we've seen in this one, the song opened, um, I think the original recording, I just listened to it this morning, um, it's got like our PJ pattern. Okay, it's quite a tricky thing to play. And it's once again, one of those things that's been produced, uh, computer RPG. So it's just a couple of notes being fed into the DAW and this thing like randomized these patterns and stuff. So that's most likely what happens. So to recreate these things that happen in the recording to listen to is sometimes difficult because it's not as, uh, especially for keyboard players. I mean, they don't always use hardware keyboards physically like we do in studio. It's all software driven stuff. And it's very difficult to emulate what's happened in the studio live. Um, that's why a lot of these big bands, um, the big worship groups will use the studio separate, the stems, the tracks that they used in the studio to record it. Those things get sampled into the keyboard, all those things get played on the back track while the band plays over them. So there's a lot of little tricks used in the industry to kind of simulate um, if you want to play something as closely as possible to the original live. But there's always that thin line between um, live and studio work, and it depends on your on your situation of praise and worship, whether your your band leader or MD wants to keep it as accurate as possible, for instance, as Bethel, or they want to do their own little thing. So those things are all part of the communication process. You need to know before you start preparing for your session what's expected of you, what key it's going to be in, stylistic um, challenges. Um, do you guys have a little more freedom to do your own thing? Are you going to do your own intro? Um, things like that just need to be communicated clearly. All right, so approaching the song still on this step. Um, so you listen to it a few times whether it's in the car and you commute to somewhere, get used to it. Start looking at specific riffs. So we said listen to the guitar intro, listen to like this little keyboard arpeggiate thing happening there. Uh, and these things are just giving you some clear cues on the song, what's happening. Whether it's like a little bass riff or like a drum fill, these sort of things. Just um, pick up on things like that once you start listening over and over. These things will start coming to you a lot more naturally once you start listen to music a lot okay so that's kind of the cues and stuff okay another important thing is the geography okay so the geography here is like like you'd read a map 
pretty much. And um, music geography that is a similar thing. It's like you have this chart in front of you. Um, how you can perform the song? Does it start with the intro? Does it start with the chorus? How does it start? Where does it go next? Okay, once you've done it, say maybe verse one, does it go to chorus? And after chorus, does it go back to intro? Does it go to the bridge? Okay, so understanding these things and almost memorize that. Um, and the way to make that easy is listening a lot to the lyrics. If you if you listen to the song a lot and you know what the lyrics, how the lyrics flow and where the lyrics are going, that will give you a lot of cues in terms of the geography or the form of the song um, where you're going to be in. And yeah, that's all I can say really about geography is just getting used to that and know where you are in the song at all times. Okay, then um, another important thing I'd say is key signatures, time signatures, technique. Okay, now technique is the beautiful thing here. So technique, um, once we've looked at the song, so in case this song was in the key of B major. So I've looked at the chord chart, because the chord chart that's the one that had the most info. Um, uh, there was five sharps written there, so I know exactly it's in the key of B major. So check out the B major scale. That's from the near the scale. Or check out other YouTube tutorials or anything online. Play the scale a couple of times. You just get that sound in your head. All right. Um, finger exercise. Let me just do like a five finger exercise on the get the sound in your head. Arpeggios, chords, everything in me. So the chords, what's the, the primary chords of um, B major will be the D, e, the E, the F sharp. Okay, primary chords, one, four, five. Those are the, kind of the important chords we will have in a specific key. Um, secondary chords will be, will be the other chords in between. So one, four, five important ones. Now how to play them, how to change them, because they're kind of the backbone of most of these songs. Um, play those things a couple of times before you actually start practicing the song. So play the scale, the B major scale a couple of times, the primary chords, the B major chord, the E major chord, the F sharp major chord, just to get that tonality stuck in your head. So once you start practicing the song, um, all the other chords in between will kind of naturally fall in place. You'll be able to hear where it's going and you'll quickly pick up a bum note if you hit the wrong chords. So, okay, wait, it doesn't sound like it's in the same key, so I'm probably playing a wrong note. So things like that are quite important. So bring the technique um, that you've learned separately and kind of embed that into learning a song. It's going to speed up your process of learning a song so much quicker and it's going to just help you in general. So this little um, tip that I've always used is like specifically work on technical aspects, scales, finger exercise, arpeggios, broken chords, block chords, whatever you're doing, work on those things that is kind of parallel to the key that you are working on in the song. It could be a minor key sometimes, you use minor scales and those things you can cover when you do a song like that. All right, so important things um, just to consider. All right, next thing, um, work into sections of the song. So if you practice, uh, work with a chord chart, put the chord chart in front of you, listen to it, try and follow with the music as it's playing where you are. So you cool the geography, you know how to jump from one section to another, and then just start playing the chord changes that's written on that chord chart along. So even if it's not the arrangement you're going for, just play the chords to see if you play the chords accurately, change the chords exactly on the beat it's supposed to change up. Like say you've got all this information on the chord chart, you don't have this information so much on the lyric chart, on the chord chart, you're really spoiled for choice because you can see when you need to change the chord exactly and you can really focus on the rhythm section playing parts, opposed to a lyric thing where you have to follow lyrics all the time. So just play the chord changes, even if it's any instrument, it doesn't have to be your, your, your preferred patch or, or um, sound that you're supposed to use for it, just to get going, changing your chords. Okay, once you're comfortable with that, you can get through the changes from the intro through to the end of the song. Then we're going to start delving into looking at sounds that's going to work. So um, guys, this is a very important step. Um, you all probably have a smartphone. Um, if I ask you to go into some setting of your phone, you can ask quickly, you go, yeah, it's settings, there, 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 done. Okay, so like the way you know your smartphone, 
settings, you need to know your keyboard. Your keyboard, essentially, that's your money making machine. So you need to know this thing as well as you know your smartphone. And that is important in terms of finding sounds. Um, we don't have pedal boards and stuff like guitar players or bass players to quickly change sounds. We sometimes have to go delve into deep menus and stuff to get to these things. So most keyboards these days have shortcut buttons and stuff, and you can program set lists and stuff. Um, I'm using a core cross uh, two in, in front of me here, and it's a fairly easy thing to do. I can find sounds, use presets. Okay, so presets are the sounds your keyboard ship with. Okay, so this is not going to sound design or anything as of yet, but um, that's a good start. Just get familiarized with the categories of sounds. So you'll have a piano category, you'll have an electronic piano category, organs, bells, pads, strings, synths, um, and depending on what keyboard you have, those things can get a little bit more complicated and they can even subcategorize a little bit more. But know the categories of what sound you're using. If you're going to play, um, let's say, strings or whatever, that might be a category on its own. So under the string category, you might have violins, viholas, um, string, the chamber orchestra, um, full strings, uh, Hollywood strings, whatever. So know those kind of things, where to find them, and see if they're shortcut buttons. So you can assign that specific sound to a button in your keyboard. So if you need to change sounds, it's just bam, that button, and it's done. I have to go through menus and you know waste everyone's time on stage because you can't find your sound. So. Try to um, figure out that thing. All keyboards are different, but they all kind of work the same, essentially different brands. You get the Rolands, um, uh, the Korgs, the Yamahas, also very cool in that sense. But they all have some sort of shortcut method of putting your sounds in order for the set that you're going to play. Um, another thing that's important is learning how to layer sounds. So, for instance, putting a piano sound with a string sound simultaneously. So, if you play the key, it will it will sound or will resonate strings and it will play the piano sound exactly together um, then you also have different zones on the keyboard so in terms of layering you can split the keyboard now the chords you can split it quite a few different places so you can have certain things that could be triggered in the left hand by assigning single notes even to certain arpeggiated patterns and it just makes your life a lot easier if you're the only keyboard player in the band and you're a small congregation and you have to play a lot of parts and it can, can get tricky because a lot of these um, worship songs are written or produced in a, in, a, in a studio environment where they had the luxury of layering uh, a lot of keyboard parts and stuff and it's virtually you've got two hands and you can only do so much so it gets tricky especially for the only person in your band to try and execute that sort of thing so um, learn your instrument, know the settings now to get to certain things, try to find the sounds, um, what you listen to on the recording, to see how close you can get them. Um, if you're familiar with sound design and production and that stuff, then I'm sure you know how to manipulate sounds, or even design your own sounds, which you can do. Um, I'm not an expert on sound design as such, I've done a little bit of that work in the past, and it's quite a bit of work, so you, you need to know what you're doing there to basically design a sound from scratch up or sample a sound and getting that sound you know, exactly the way you want to. So very important, just know your gear, know how to program your keyboards, how to find your sounds quickly, and um, yeah, that will make life a lot easier. Okay, so talking about working on sections of the song, so once you've listened to the song, you've gone just through the basic chords of the song on any sound, and you get to a point where the keyboard is programmed, um, you've got the sound you're looking for. It's working on different sections of the song. Okay, so start with maybe an intro. Uh, just repeat that. Put the recording on loop if you possibly have software to do so, or put a verse on loop, or anything you particularly battle with. Um, loop that section of the recording. If you've got software to do, I mean, there's a lot of um, uh, software out there, I suppose I can't think of anything right now, but I think most computers, um, there's even apps uh, for smartphones that can actually slow down, there's one of the things called Amazing Slowdown or something like that, um, that you can put a, a recording into it and if the tempo is quite fast, it can actually bring down that recording for you without changing the pitch, because you know if something slows down, it goes 
quick like a weird pitch. So um, we want something that can slow it down, or speed it up for that matter even, without changing the pitch. And that is good to have something like that. You can put two selectors together, and listen to that section over and over and over and try to play along until you get the part done. So it's all the things that you can, um, you know, utilize technology and just make your practice section a lot easier. All right, the next thing I want to talk about, a little bit contradictory probably, <coughs> excuse me, don't over prepare. Okay, so what does that mean? Okay, so in the beginning we said, so you got booked for the gig or booked for the Sunday service. And I told you about things I would expect from a worship leader or a band leader or an indie and setting the charts, having the correct key and having a reference song. All those things in place so you can just go home, listen to it, check out the chart, play along with it, go to your rehearsal. And rehearsal should be the easy part, actually, because if you've really thoroughly done your homework, everybody in the band has done their homework, and you get together and say, Thursday night when most of these rehearsals tend to happen, um, it's just a case of top and tail. It's okay, it's counting the song, play through, oh, cool, one more time, okay, play through, now, next song. Cool, and you're ready. I haven't wasted anyone's time, quick and easy rehearsal. And Sunday you walk up for the gig. Okay, that's an ideal world. Um, you know, I've worked in, in, in some churches where they actually gave us um, the songs, uh, sent us the, the charts, uh, emailed us the charts, sent us uh, a reference track, sent us a backtrack even, which is really cool. And um, I enjoyed this particular church that, that they actually have a backtrack and they took your specific part out. So then you have a backtrack um, with a band playing minus the keyboard parts so you can read your parts that's specifically written out for you and you can play along with the backtrack and it, and it just make the process easier. Um, that's obviously a lot of work and that's most of the times bigger churches where they have a full-time um, MD working permanently for the church and the whole day that's when he sits and does is making backtracks and making charts and make sure everything is ready for the Sunday service. Um, that's not always um, the case. It's, it's quite a luxury to have in one of those churches. Uh, it's very nice, but I mean, sometimes we have very small congregations and there isn't budget or time for these things. Okay, this is bringing me back to my point of don't overprepare. And especially when the communication wasn't as clear as you had hoped it to be. Um, you might just get um, a WhatsApp message and maybe a couple of YouTube links that this kind of something you No charts, nothing. Okay, then in that case, um, if I really don't know the song, I would kind of scribble down a little basic chart for me. And I would do something like the, the chord chart we looked at earlier. Um, just on a piece of paper, it doesn't have to be physically um, written up notes, it could just be like, you know, like these little bar lines on a blank piece of paper, so you can just see time as it goes, and maybe put chord symbols on as you work out the song on your own at home, which sometimes happens a lot of the times. So in a case like that, where you um, then do the song, don't over-prepare in that sense, so you get to your rehearsal, it's on the Thursday night type thing, um, it can either be like that, it's like last minute, okay, you're not doing the song anymore. So if you've done this beautiful arrangement and you spend six hours on it, I'm sure you're not going to feel very happy in your heart if the music director tells you you're not doing this anymore. Okay, so don't over prepare in that sense. Also, they might change the key. Or they're like, okay, no, but we sent you that version on YouTube, but we're actually going to do this one, and it's a completely different version of the song. So if you put in hours and hours of preparation and you get to the first time you so, um, I'm sure you're going to be mad as hell, because I would be as well. So in that sense, where you're, you have a, a, a type of worship team where things are not always running as smoothly as they're supposed to run, or the communication isn't as clear as you want it to be, don't over-prepare. Prepare to the point where you sort of know the song, you can do the chord changes, but you haven't wasted your time perfecting the thing. Because if these things last and then it change on a Thursday night or so, then you can go home and like have an understanding of what you've done so far and how you can change it now to suit it to the uh, service for the following Sunday. So um, important 
Um, it's, it sounds a bit contradictory to say that over prepared, we should always want to be as prepared as possible for any situation. But um, personal experience, I've also worked in bands where we literally transcribe up our keyboard parts. Took me hours written, writing out everything, do the keyboard programming. And if you find on the rehearsal, like three or four of those songs, it's not even going to happen. It took hours to do so. So just little tips and tricks, things you learn how the industry works. Things are very last minute in the industry. Um, and always worked, uh, work as perfectly as you think it would. But it all boils down to communication, the uh, very first step we talked about. So it's important to know well in advance what's expected of you in terms of arrangement, key of the song, um, what versions can be played. Um, things don't always happen that way, but if possible, to get all that information um, well in advance, and it gives you some time and opportunity to prepare. And be ready for your first year. So, anyway, yeah, guys, it's just kind of uh, some of the talking points um, I have in terms of how to practice a song. Um, it's a very repetitive process. I mean, you're just going to sit and practice thing over and over until you get it right. And it's hard work. It's not going to be easy. No shortcuts, really. Um, I hope this answered some of your questions. Um, if there's any other questions you have, please don't hesitate to let Kurt know, and we can do a, a Q and A session soon. Anyway, hope you guys have a lovely day and stay safe and stay warm.